with our message time. Gen- turn to Genesis 2, and uh, that's where we're going to be uh, today. We're continuing this series that we've, we, we've started, and it's in the book of Genesis. We're just calling it Origins, and, and we're calling it that because we're, we're going back to the beginning. And we've been looking at God's good creation in every way. Um, but, but what we're going to discover today is that something happened with God's good creation. There, there was a, a, an event where God's creation gets corrupted. And it causes all kinds of problems that we're still dealing with and see today. Uh, to begin, I want to show you a video that I think really sums up and illustrates the problem that we're going to talk about. And I think it drives home our point really well today. Take a look. Look at me. You can have fruit snacks, but you can't have them right now. Okay? You gotta wait. You gotta wait until mommy and daddy come back. Okay? You can't eat these yet. You gotta wait until we come back. I'm gonna leave them right here. Don't touch them. Wait. Okay? We're gonna come back. Don't eat them yet. Don't eat them. We'll be right back. We just gotta go get something. Just go. Just wait a second. Uh, yeah you know that video it's really cute and it's really funny it's really cute um, but it sort of reveals a problem and the problem is is that from a very young age we've got a propensity for rebellion don't we I mean, there's something in us that draws us to do the things that we know that we shouldn't do. And of course, it can go beyond eating fruit snacks, and and it does, and and it can lead actually to all sorts of of evil. And that thing that we see in kids at such a very young age, it has potential for great harm as we get older. So I want us to see where this comes from. Like, what, what, what is it that's going on inside of us? What is it that sort of leads to all the sort of the mess that we're seeing today? And then ultimately, what's the solution? And of course, God's Word, I think, reveals all of that to us. And so we're going to start in chapter 2. We're going to get to chapter 3. But let's begin in verse 15 in Genesis chapter 2 uh, this morning. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And so God puts Adam and then later Eve in the garden. At this point, everything is still completely good, untainted. Adam and Eve, they're literally living in paradise. They're in the garden. God gives them one simple rule. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if you know the rest of the story and how this goes, right, we, we, we know, uh, you know, you, you might question God's decision making. You know, why, why, Lord, even put a tree in the garden if you know that man is going to fall and it's going to cause all of these major, major issues? And we talked about this a little bit last week. We said, well, that tree that was in the garden... It represented God's authority. Man and woman were to work the garden, to keep it, but ultimately the world belonged to God. But he says that you can eat from any other tree other than this tree of knowledge of good and evil, but then this happens one day. Look at chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 1. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the, from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. Eve actually adds to God's command here, right? He didn't say anything that we read about them not touching it, but Eve sort of adds her own requirements here. And, of course, mankind, we're pretty good at doing this, right? We're, we're pretty good at adding 
to what God says, right? We're, 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 we're good at sort of, uh, you know, making up, making up rules that God never really uh, established. But Eve says we can eat from the tree, or we can't eat from that tree, we can't even touch it. And then look how Satan replies in verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, technically speaking, he's right. Their eyes will be open. They will know the difference between good and evil, but he's misleading them overall. In fact, pay attention to a few things. I want you to notice a couple of things. First, what does he do? Satan comes to them as a friend. He, he comes to them sort of as a close companion. He doesn't start talking badly about God. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't say, hey, just bow down and follow me. None of that. He approaches them, and it looks like he just wants to talk. And, of course, this is one of Satan's strategy that he uses, right? He doesn't come in a manner that you and I would expect. Uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 that Satan masquerades as a, an angel of light. And so he may come to you in the same manner, right? He may come to you a friend, a, a trusted co-worker, a family member. He doesn't come in the way that we uh, often expect it. And notice the nature of this conversation. Again, he doesn't say just, hey, bow down and worship me. He comes and he says, hey, you know, let's have a religious discussion. Uh, let's talk a little theology. Uh, let, let's, you know, did, did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And that sounds like an innocent question, right? I mean, like, let me just make this, like he just wants to be clear on what God's word is saying. And it's so deceiving that it works. He's still doing the same thing today. And I, I don't know if you know this or not, or if you're aware of this or not, but we have a generation of young people today who are deconstructing their faith. Um, and this is, this is all across the country in, in, every, in, every, in every corner, right? They're questioning Christianity. They're, they're wondering if this is true. And again, these are kids that often they're, they, they've come up in the church or, or you know, they have a, a faith background. And oftentimes this deconstruction leads them to a point to where what's left looks very little like historic Christianity at all. Like it looks very little like what we see, uh, that what, what Jesus has left us with, or at worst, it, it takes them away from God entirely. And do you know the question that they begin with? Do you know what leads them down to this? It's this question. Did God really say? Did, did God really say, like, that marriage, I mean, it's it's permanent? Did, did God really say that marriage is between a, a man and a woman? I mean, how about how people feel? Well, what about our uh, attraction? Maybe, that, maybe the Bible just means like where, where love is absent, right? Did, did God really say like, that, like sex is actually intended for marriage? I mean, that's ridiculous. We live in the 21st century. Are we really that simple-minded? Did, did God really say that hell is a, like a, a real place for those who reject Jesus? How does that square with a loving God. Again, there, there's a whole generation of young people and older people, right? It's not just young people who are encountering this exact same question today. And it's leading to all sorts of problems. And listen, I'm not saying you can't ever uh, question your faith or wrestle. You should, right? I mean, I've told you before, if you're not ever wrestling with your faith, you ain't got much faith. There's not much there if there's never any questions or any, like even doubts and some things that you're struggling with. But that's one of Satan's schemes, and we've got to be aware of it. For some of you, like you, you know, that's not the issue. You know, you would say that you're pretty orthodox, you know, in terms of your faith and how that goes. But what happens is Satan comes to you with a different application. He comes to you and says, did God really say, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you? Really? Because, I mean, if that's true... You wouldn't be in the predicament that you find yourself in right now. I mean, did, did God really say that? Your needs would be, did God really say, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you? Because right now I'm looking around, I don't see God anywhere around. 
And so Satan comes, right? This is a, he, he, he's, he, the way he's done this hasn't changed throughout, uh, since the very beginning of time. He comes and he gets us to question our faith. But not only that, notice what else he does. He comes and he really gets us to question the goodness of God. Do you see what he's doing here with Eve? He's trying to get all of her attention focused on the single tree in the garden that was prohibited. Right? Forget about all the blessings of God that that she has and she's enjoying. Forget about all the other trees that she could eat eat from. Forget about all the things that she has. Satan wants her to think about the one thing she doesn't have. Hayden Robinson said that uh, Satan comes along and he tries to poison the well. And once the well is poisoned, then all the water is destroyed. You've probably heard that phrase before, but isn't that true? I, I don't know about you, but I know that this is pretty common strategy that Satan uses in my life right? Let's get your attention focused on that single something that you don't have and then forget about all these incredible blessings that you do have. And if you let that linger, if you pay attention to that long enough, you'll begin to doubt God's goodness in your own life and it very well can lead to disobedience. Then notice what happens in verse 6. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also de- uh, desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now that passage of Scripture may not jump off the page, but that's those words right there. What happened in that moment changed our world forever. Adam and Eve ate from this tree that God had prohibited and his good creation uh, was corrupted. And, And there's three major problems that come. Because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, we see three big time problems that come along with it. First, you've got their separation from God. They're separated from God. Verse seven, then the eyes of both of them were opened And they realized they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, well, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put me, you put here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Everybody's blaming somebody else, right? Everybody's pointing fingers. Adam said it was her. She said it was the the, the serpent. Everybody's blaming, but both Adam and Eve were responsible that day. And sin, sin separates us from God. Do you notice what Adam and Eve did? Immediately when they're, like, after the, the fall, after they ate this fruit, they, they hid When their eyes were opened, they hid, not from each other. They were hiding from God. All of a sudden, they realized they were naked and they hid. And see, this is what happens when a sinner gets in the presence of God. You hide. You cower down. You bow down. You do not, like, you know you've got no business being in his presence. Remember when Jesus approached Peter? Peter had been out fishing all night and, And Jesus comes to him and says, hey, cast your net over here on this other side. And he does so, and they cast the net on the other side, and they drag in so many fish that the boat began to sink. And when Peter saw Jesus, Luke says that he fell at his feet and said, go away from me, I'm a sinful man. See, that's what happens when we are are in the presence of God. Isaiah 59, 2 says, It is your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, He has turned away, and He will not listen anymore. Our sin keeps us separated. 
Now, you may think, my sin's really not all that bad, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not perfect, but I'm not, you know, it's, it's not all that bad. Do you, do, you know who, do you know who thinks that? Do you know who has those thoughts that my sin just really isn't all that bad? It's people who haven't been transformed by God's grace. See, the closer you get to God, the more you realize how absolute desperate you that you are for His mercy. The more you mature in your faith, the more you realize how much fear and lust and gluttony and worry and comfort and apathy and all this other junk that is embedded deeply in there. Sin separates us from God. That's the first result that we see. The second is this, that the earth's cursed and a power struggle began. The earth is cursed and a power struggle began. Look at verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you'll give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. And so from that text, we see how the curse changed everything. The curse changed the complexity of creation. He cursed the serpent. He cursed childbirth. It's now going to be painful. He, he cursed the ground. It's going to produce weeds and thorns. Men and women, they're going to struggle to, be, to live in harmony. And the, and the biggest and most immediate change is that no longer will mankind live forever. They're not going to be able to eat from the tree of the garden, uh, that, that, uh, the tree of life. The curse changed everything. It changed everything. And Adam's sin, listen, Adam's sin became your sin. And Adam's sin became mine. Paul says in Romans 5, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sin. Adam's sin became our sin. But the good news of the gospel, of course, is that Jesus, the second Adam, came. And what happened? Our sin became his sin. His righteousness became our righteousness. But now because of sin, death's ushered in the world. But it's not just death. So is disease and disaster and tragedies and pain and suffering. They're all biblically linked to sin's introduction into the world. Paul says it like this in Romans 8. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Because of sin, grave consequences followed. And then third, because of sin, man will be born with a sin problem. Man is going to be born with a sin problem. Now, I know that that's socially not correct to say, right? Um, modern psychology will, will say that we're all basically born good, sort of on a level playing field, and you know we just may need some help in certain areas. But Scripture says just the opposite. It says that we are basically in big trouble unless God intervenes to change our life. This is where you hear Christians sometimes talking about depravity. Now, 
Christians disagree uh, often to the extent of that depravity, but all Christians agree that, uh, agree that we are born with a sin problem and only God can deal with it. David said this in Psalm 51, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. See, this is the world as we know it. And going back to the beginning here, it helps us to see all the junk that we're dealing with today. This is why, you know, uh, you know I look back just on this past couple of weeks. And, you know, well, why do you have a shootings in, at a church in Houston? Uh, at a shooting at a parade in Kansas City where they're, they're celebrating. Wars in Ukraine and Israel and genocide in other areas, evil and violence and broken homes and crazy weather and tragedy all around us and little toddlers disobeying their parents. What's the answer? <laughs> That's the answer. It started here. Genesis chapter 3 from the curse. Now I think there's some important things that we need to take away. There's some important things that we need to do and remember in light of this text that we're seeing today. And we've got to be reminded of. These are going to be brief. Here's the first one, just simply this. I've got a sin problem. And if left unrestrained, it is capable of causing terrible evil. Do you understand that, church? We, we've got a sin problem. And if, it is le- like if it's unrestrained, it is going to cause big time trouble uh, most of you know i spent some time in prison i mean i didn't spend time in prison. i worked there but i mean you know i i didn't go because of a crime i, I <laughs> y'all like what i didn't know that right um but but part of it was like i was working i was uh, you know was, uh, spent about a year in a federal um uh, a federal prison in in lexington kentucky and and i worked there in that institution and there was every type of criminal that you could imagine There were uh, murderers, child molesters, drug dealers, bank robbers, gang bangers, tax fraud, literally any kind of crime that you could imagine. Do you know what my conclusion was, though? The longer I spent time there, it really didn't take much time at all. You know what I was surprised to see? Many of these men, they weren't much different from me. They, They weren't much different from me at all uh, one or two bad mistakes right for most of us and we're right there with them and then it got me thinking back you know a little bit even you know my own childhood I've, I think I've shared this maybe a little bit with, with you before but um, you know I, I grew up where I grew up in, in Kentucky I, we lived when I was about three years old we moved to uh, a neighborhood it was a, a nice neighborhood there was lots of houses Tons of kids. Uh, my very two best friends that were my age that I played with the most. Um, one of my, my very best friend, he has spent, um, I don't think I'm exaggerating to say, 95% of his adult life in prison um, due to drugs and drug related issues that come with that from robbery and whatever it may be, uh, right on down the line. My other close friend that I grew up with, spent time with, played uh, as a kid, um, murdered his wife and then committed suicide. This is why I often say I shudder to think what my life would be like, but had it be for the grace of God. I mean, we are capable of all kinds. And listen, I know I'm not saying like that you're going to, like that you, you know, that you you know, that you're a bad, I'm not, I, listen, I know you're capable of good. We're all capable of good because we've been created in God's image, but we are also, because of our sin, capable of all kinds of just terrible, terrible things. Had it not been for the grace of God, I mean, are you sickened by the this messed up world we live in? I think most of us, we look around like, gosh, all of this stuff, even in our own community, broken homes and families and, and drugs and problems and so much on down the line. If you're sickened by that, you know what you got to do? You got to tell somebody about Jesus. You, you got to tell somebody about Jesus. I mean, I look back and I'm thinking, thank you, God, that a church was planted. 
and but then my family took me they introduced me to christ and my life has been absolutely changed ever since god thank you for that if you, like if you're sickened by this world like the answer is jesus and i know we think well hey that's just what we say in church no no that's the answer that's literally the answer this is why our hope listen we can educate and we should we can use scare tactics, we can legislate, but until a person's sin problem is dealt with, very little is going to be accomplished. Do you understand that? Listen, this is why our hope is never in trying to gain some political power, or our hope is never in trying to gain power. Our hope is in the real power of the gospel. This is where the true, like this is the, the dynamite of God. This is the power of God to change and transform your life and mine. He's transformed mine. Has he yours? Amen? And he continues to do so. But we're capable. Parents, your little ones, they're capable. This is why Scripture is full of, of a discipline. Like you teach them and you train them. Why? Because if you don't, well, there's all kinds of trouble out there. And there's got an enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Secondly, and it kind of goes right along with what I just said. We've got to allow Jesus to change us. We must allow Jesus to change us. The only way that we overcome this sin problem is a surrendered life to Christ. Paul says in Galatians 5, 24, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. See, if you are in Christ, what does that mean? Well, it means that you're able to live in step with the Spirit. It means that you're able to overcome the desires that wage against your flesh. You understand that? This is our hope. Right? That part of your nature, that sinful nature that we're born with, gets crucified as we come to know Jesus. Listen, for some of you, maybe today, I don't know, I'm just guessing. It's probably true. Like, it's time to start messing, stop messing around with sin. It's time to stop playing games. You can only scoop fire in your lap so many times before you get burn the proverb says sin as it's been said will take you farther than you want to go it'll cost you more than you want to pay and keep you there longer than you want to stay and listen i get it i get it we're in an uphill battle aren't we i mean this is a battle i don't know about you but like it's a like every day i'm battling lord you know and and, and maybe in your group your sunday school uh, there's a passage there out of Romans 7 that, that, that you may look up where Paul's talking about this struggle with sin. Like, I, I, don't, I don't do the things I want to do. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. And there's this, like, there's this battle. I understand that. We're going to constantly be battling and waging war in our flesh. Martin Luther, I, used to, I love how he, used to, how he would say this. Uh, he, he would use a Latin phrase to describe the fact that we, that, that we are that we're in Christ, we have victory, we're saints, and yet we're still in this battle with our sinful nature. And he would, he would use this phrase, he would say that, um, this Latin phrase, simul justus et peccator. And that doesn't mean anything to us probably unless you, you know, have some Latin training, but it means simply at the same time righteous and sinner. At the same time, righteous and sinner. Well, at the same time, we are justified, we are, we are righteous, but we're also a sinner because we're still, part, like we're still in the flesh. We're still waiting for the Lord to complete His work. And he goes on to say that means that we are at all times capable of heroic love, but also unspeakable evil. And so I get it. Like we're in a battle, and may we never forget that battle. May we always be ready to put on the armor of God to defend Satan's schemes. But God has given us the power we need to overcome this, uh, the, the, these desires. Uh, Paul says it like this in Romans 8. You are controlled not by the sinful nature, 
but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. And so you've got to ask yourself this morning, are you controlled by the Spirit? Or are you controlled by your flesh? Are you controlled by the Spirit? Or are you controlled by your desires? What is it for you? And then lastly, thirdly is this. You know that you've overcome sin when that sin becomes something that you hate. You know, like, how do I know, preacher? Like, well, what is it like? Because I'm in this struggle. I know that we've got this problem. Well, listen, do you want to know how you know when you've overcome sin, when you're really walking in step with the Spirit? You hate that sin. You don't want it to be part of your life anymore. Do you hate it? We're going to struggle with it. Listen, we're going to struggle with sin. Nobody's perfect in this room. But if you don't hate it, if you're coddling, if you're messing around with it, like, yeah, you know what? Listen, that's a problem. And if you don't hate your sin, you know what else? It's an indication that you're probably not as close to God as you think you are because when God is near, do you know what happens? People either hide like Adam and Eve or they fall at his feet like Peter. I want you to, to bow your head with me if you would and just close your eyes. And I just want you to spend a little bit of time in reflection because I think this is really, really important. And, and I know that, um, you know, we're all at different places, but th- let me just ask you, what sin today do you need to lay at the foot of the cross? Is there something in your life like it's, you just can't seem to overcome it? And it just continues to rob you and to take from you? If so, today, like if there's something that you need to lay down, just ask God for forgiveness, ask God for strength. Or maybe for some of you, there's something that Satan has put in your mind or your heart to make you doubt God's goodness. Like that tree there in the garden, like you just can't, like there's just one thing you're just constantly focused on. Listen, you know what uh, Jesus said whenever uh, Peter said something, you know, to him about God's will? He said, get behind me, Satan. That, that may be what you need to say to him today. Get behind me. Get away from me. Again, asking God for strength. Repentance. Listen, we talk about repentance a lot, but understand this. Repentance isn't just pleading for mercy before a judge. Someone said it like this. It's opening your wound to a physician. And so are you willing to open up that wound to the physician, the great physician today? And then, of course, the good news that we have and we proclaim hopefully week after week is that our victory is in Christ. He's made all things new. He's given us the power to overcome. Someone said it like this. Adam, though guilty, said, don't blame me, blame my wife. The second Adam, Jesus, though innocent, said, don't blame my wife. Talking about us, the church. Blame me. Father God, we, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy. God, we thank you for the grace that you've poured out. Lord, we thank you that though we're guilty, you said don't, don't blame them, blame me. And so, Lord, if there's anyone today here who... Um, God, you, you know what our struggle is. You know the things that we're dealing with. And, and Father, I, I just pray for your strength. And, Lord, I, I pray that they would be reminded today that greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. And, uh, Lord, that victory would overcome these temptations that we deal with by the evil one. Lord, challenge us, change us, help us to follow you. And, God, if there's any here today, maybe you've never trusted in you for the very first time. God, work in their life and their hearts. Father, we love you and we give you praise and thanks. We ask it in Jesus' name.